Welcome back to Faith Formation at Home, our final week of Faith Formation at Home, or at least the final week of all these videos and catechism questions and all that good stuff. But you've still got this book, and we're only halfway through it, so I would encourage you, each Sunday, pick it up, read through the gospel, talk about it a little bit. Uh, it'll take you even less time than Faith Formation at Home has. All right, so this week's gospel is for Divine Mercy Sunday, right? We celebrate Jesus' divine mercy, and it's one of my favorite gospel accounts of the resurrection. The first half of it takes place on Easter Sunday, a week ago, right? The apostles are hanging out in this upper room with the doors locked because they're terrified of what might happen to them, and Jesus shows up and reveals himself to them, talks to them for a while, and they're like, oh my gosh, he's actually alive. But Thomas is not in the room with them. He's off shopping, <laughs> fishing, I don't know what he's doing, but he's not hanging out in the upper room. Maybe he was the only one of them brave enough not to be hiding, right? He's living his life, right? So he's kind of moving on a little bit. When he comes back, the other apostles tell him, we just saw Jesus, he's alive. And Thomas is the ultimate skeptic, the skeptic skeptic, right? He's like, all right, I'm not taking your word for it. I've lived with you for three years. I've ministered with you. We've, we've cast out demons. We've healed people. We've seen Jesus do crazy stuff together. I don't believe you. <laughs> what? Yeah, he's like, I don't believe you guys. Unless I can actually touch Jesus myself, you can hear him bragging a little bit, right? The only way I'm going to believe is if I can actually touch Jesus. Forget about your, your testimony. And so a week later, that would be today, Divine Mercy Sunday, Jesus shows up again when Thomas is there. And he's like, all right, Thomas, go ahead. Stick your finger in my nail hole. Here's my side. Go ahead. Right? And he was at, Thomas was actually able to do it because Jesus rose from the dead. His soul went back into his body. He wasn't just a ghost. He wasn't this disembodied spirit floating around out there that they could reach through. They could actually touch him. But there's something about him that he still had the marks of his passion in his body, in his risen and glorified body. He kept those. It's awesome. That was a choice of God to keep the marks by which he freed us from our sins in his body that he keeps forever in God. That's awesome, right? God loves us so much that he takes on our nature, he takes on a body, and he keeps it forever even with the marks of the suffering that he endured for us, right? If I'm one of the apostles at this point when Jesus shows up, I'm a little nervous because the last time I saw Jesus, I ran like a scared little kid when he needed me the most. And so Jesus shows up now, and I'm, gonna, I'm waiting for him to, to scold me, to yell at me, right? And the first thing Jesus says is peace, right? Jesus did not come to scream and yell at us and to make us feel bad for us. He came to take away our sins, and he forever bears in his body the sign that that's what he came for. And so if doubting Thomas can ultimately believe in Jesus and realize he rose from the dead, we should believe in Jesus and the resurrection as well. Our Bible story for our little ones from the Jesus Storybook Bible is God Sends Help. This is the story of Pentecost. This isn't going to happen until the end of the Easter season in like a month and a half, uh, but it's too good of a story to let the faith formation year end without looking at it, at least with our little ones. So this is the story of 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus ascended back into heaven. And the apostles ran back to the upper room, <laughs> and they kind of hunkered down, and they weren't sure what to do. Jesus told them, just pray for the coming of the Holy Spirit. They weren't sure what that meant. And so for nine days, they're in the upper room praying, and then finally on the ninth day on Pentecost, the Spirit comes into the room with this sound that sounds like a rushing wind, and these things appeared over their heads that they said kind of looked like tongues of fire, maybe. And then all of a sudden, they were able to speak in different languages. And they were able to speak in their own native language, Aramaic, and people could hear them in their own language, Greek, Latin, Russian, you know, lots of different languages. It's a fascinating story because these scared apostles who were hiding out in the upper room when they received the Holy Spirit, you can't get them to stop talking about Jesus. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to help you do as well. He wants to help you become a fanatic for Jesus. Not in a bad sense of the word, but in the sense of like, you know, those really big fans of the Steelers or the Penguins or the Pirates or fans of whatever, you can't get them to stop talking about it, right? They always bring up their favorite sports team or whatever they're a fanatic about, right? The Instant Pot or the <laughs> whatever the thing is, right? That's what the Holy Spirit wants to help us be is fanatics of Jesus so that we can always find a way to just kind of bring them up subtly and always turn the conversation back to Jesus. He wants us to go out there and tell people about the awesome things that he's done and the love that he has for us, and all the good things that he has in store for us. And that's what the Holy Spirit is all about. Catechism questions for our older kids are focusing on the last few questions on prayer. So going through this whole book, or the yellow version for our middle schoolers, the way the catechism is structured, we start off with, in this one, the orange section, 
right? The big questions, how do we know that there is a God? Why is there a world when there, there wouldn't have to be a world? How can we possibly know about this God? And then the yellow section, we know that there's a God and we want to respond in faith. What do we say we believe about this God? So the yellow section walks us through those 12 articles of the creed, right? What can we, what can we know about this God that actually exists and created the world? Then the orange section, so we know that there's a God, we know what to believe about him. Uh, what do we do with that? How do we celebrate that? How do we live that collectively, liturgically? And so the orange section focuses on the seven sacraments and on the liturgy, things that we celebrate publicly, ways that we encounter God in a tangible, sensate way through the sacraments. So now that we know there's a God, we know what to believe about him, we know how to celebrate that publicly, how should we live our lives? That's what that blue section is all about. It's the morality section. It goes through the Ten Commandments, right? What does this God expect of us? What does he want from us? Uh, and how can we live the good life? And then lastly, once you know that there's a God, you know what you can believe about him, you know how to live that out publicly, liturgically, in the sacraments and the liturgy, privately in your own moral life. How do you have a relationship with that being? Because that's what he ultimately wants. And that's what this green section, the prayer section, is all about. So our last few questions in here deal with the Psalms. They're kind of Israel's prayer book. Uh, the Psalms deal with every emotion under the sun. Right? And the message of the book of Psalms is you can pray with however you feel. If you're frustrated, scream at the heavens. If you're sad, cry at God. Cry with God. If you're excited, just burst with joy and giggle right, at God. That can be a prayer. That's what the Psalms do. Um, and then what I think is one of the most important questions in here is question 156. How do you bless someone or something? And it brings up a very important point. Parents, you have a spiritual authority over your children that nobody else has. Uh, we as parents should bless our children on a regular basis. I try to bless my kids at bedtime. Certainly before I go to bed, I sneak into their rooms and I, I lay a hand on them and I bless them. Um, but other times too, throughout the day, when they're going off to school, you can bless them. It can be a simple, may God bless you. It can be a simple, just tracing a cross on their forehead. There's lots of different ways of doing this. Uh, but parents blessing our kids, it's a hugely important thing. Uh, and it means a lot to them when we do it too, especially if you start it when they're young. But if they're older, start it anyhow. Um, and then this concludes with, why do we say amen? Amen just means I agree with that with my whole heart, right? We end every prayer with amen. It means what I just said, yes, absolutely, right? When we receive communion or we receive any sacrament, right, the body of Christ, we say amen. I believe that that's true. Uh, when we receive absolution in the sacrament of confession, amen, I believe that that's true. Uh, and so amen, it's kind of a great end to our prayers. It's a great end to the catechetical year. Uh, and so amen.